welcome to the Experience Points podcast. I'm your host, Tim Burris, and I'm joined by two co-hosts this week, uh, Kem and Luanne, who are Hello. back with me. Hey. If you're new to the podcast, uh, each week we're inviting two guests to discuss a topic related to environment art. This week we're going to be discussing materials and the creation of materials, and I'm joined by Enrico and Jonathan. Welcome, guys. Hey. Enrico, can you start us off by introducing yourself? Uh, yes. Hi. Thank you for having me here. Um, so my name is Enrico Domekant, and uh, I'm currently working at Canada Play Games as an environment artist and with the main focus on the materials. Awesome. And Jonathan, what about you? Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Jonathan Benainous, and I started in the video game industry about 14 years ago. And uh, today I'm advanced texture artist at WB Games Montreal. So as I said, we're going to be discussing material art. We've got some phenomenal material artists with us. I mean, even Kem and Luan are well versed in material creation. So really, to start us off, I guess uh, we should kind of talk about a bit what is material art or to someone who doesn't know or someone who's perhaps just getting into it, how would you describe material art? Uh, Enrico, what do you think? Um, as a material artist or material art itself, like it's, well, first of all, I would say that it's something very new to the industry. Like it's just the, the last couple of years now it's been booming, but but uh, I would say that it's, it's making textures and paying attention to details. It's like, the main thing as a material artist and yeah the, as a material artist you make materials <laughs> makes sense <laughs> <laughs> how but um kind of curious like how that's evolved over time because you said that it's it's a relatively new thing in the industry so um is that just a natural progression yeah it's uh it's a little bit even like a weird thing that uh like some years back like it was so that uh, 3D artists were supposed to do everything from modeling, texturing, to like blockouts to do, so, you know, texturing and making materials on their own. But now it's uh, so that material art is kind of like steered off on its own path, and it's an actual position that you can have now making materials. So, you know, like 3D artists can relax a little bit more; they don't need to focus on uh, textures as much as uh, they were needed before. So I think it's, it's it's a cool thing and it's uh, fairly new and uh, as there aren't a lot of positions, there are still quite a lot in a way that something so new it's it's growing in the industry. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm you know I totally agree with you, Enrico. Basically, um, you know I used to be like environment artist for about like ten years, uh, and you know I, I used to I used to do textures when I was environment artist. But I became more and more specialized into it, like I would say, like the, during the last five years. And I really noticed that there was an evolution uh, between before and now because, you know, it's becoming uh, more technical, basically. So you really need to uh, focus more on that topic specifically because it demands like more knowledge than before. Uh, so this is how I, I see it. And uh, I don't know if it makes sense for you guys, but th this is my experience basically so far. Was there anything specific that made you kind of just focus on, on it? Like a thing that happened whilst you're modeling and you really got into texturing or something? Yeah, exactly. Because uh, basically I, I really love like, uh, I still love modeling. I still love making environment. Uh, but, you know, when I, I started to see that you could like create so many crazy things with your height map and more or less like uh, do some modeling. But with textures, I really started to really look into it more in depth and I really wanted to push, to push it further. And uh, that, that's why I, I decided to like move on from environment art to uh, being texture artist and, and more focused on materials because I really find a, a, a sort of good compromise between like modeling but also the texturing part and um, it's true that now when you're working on like big AAA game the most of the time you kind of have to choose 
uh, what you want to do because you can't do everything, unfortunately. And this isn't what I wanted to uh, push further and be and be better, basically. Uh, so I would say at the end of uh, the production of Ghost Recon Wildlands, I started to really focus on, on texture creation and material creation. I was already doing it on my free time, but this is when I really started to focus more on it. So you mentioned there that uh, it's the kind of material process has become a lot more technical, and we've seen tools like Substance Designer, where you've got these procedural packages, and obviously um, physical-based rendering coming out. I'm sure you said your tenure um, of modeling, you were around before that came out. Uh, what would you say, with all the new technology that we've got, um, really allows you to kind of bring textures to life, create what, um, these these materials that feel real? Well, I would say that, yeah, definitely it's like, I think like, you know, uh, we mostly use ZBrush before uh, to create the, the hide and stuff like that, but when Substance just came out, it was like some sort of like revolution and everybody started to take a look at it, etc. So, uh, Enrico and I are like really into like designer, like other people are more into painter and stuff like that, but it's definitely like a new way of creating materials. And I would say that uh, with cans and stuff like that, you know, you can have a lot of references and stuff that you can find on the internet. So it's really easier now to, uh, I think, go more and more into details and like bringing some extra realism to, to the materials. But yeah, you're, you're right. Like PBR just really changed everything, I think. So, um, yeah. I think that uh, Subs Designer is bringing something totally unique. That's why so many people are now uh, using it as well. Like, uh, you know, when I remember when I started using it, it was, you know, just something. Like, I had no idea what it was. <laughs> but uh, it started to give so much more to the production, what I'm seeing nowadays. Like, it's uh, it was like a, a flint to the future, if you might say it like that. Because, like, for example, right now, procedure art is uh, growing. Like, people, yeah. Like, people who know Houdini, for example, are so needed in the industry. And I think that designer is uh, something in the same lines as, you know, providing fast production pipeline if something is needed to be changed it, it can be so fast and so easily done that you don't need to actually go back to ZBrush and you know move yeah, a brick true. like one centimeter, centimeter to the right or left and yeah was there like a specific thing that you did in design that made you just click and go like ah oh, yeah this is it this is what i what i like how i like doing textures well from my side it was actually not like that it was more towards like uh, it wasn't like a specific thing. It was, I remember I watched uh, Rogelio's uh, tutorial thing, like most people. The classic. The cobblestone. Yes. <laughs> I think it's one of the best tutorials that gets you started, at least, you know, going through everything. And uh, I love the way that he was doing it so that uh, you had the possibility to try something new. So you had very limited amount of noises and everything. So, you know, you just swapped one noise out. You were like, oh, wow, you get this effect. You know, trying these things all and over again. Like, I I ended up watching like half half of the tutorial, and then I just stopped, and I was like, yeah, I'm just gonna go off road and see what I can actually make myself now. It's interesting that you know you you followed the same tutorials that we did, but like I'm really interested how Jonathan started the Baroque ceiling that probably half the internet knows him for. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> like that's yeah. a beautiful piece of art. Yeah, think, uh, well, I, thanks, thanks. I mean, I think I posted like people normally know everyone for like their personal work, and I think that one's your signature. And like, where did it start from? Like, how, why? Uh, well, basically, uh, I had the ID when I was working on Assassin's Creed Odyssey, so uh, I was working on like uh, ancient Greek temples and stuff like that. And on my free time, I wanted to, you know, try to 
try to work on on a personal project where I could learn a lot of stuff. And uh, I had the chance to go to Rome uh, a few years back, and I had a few pictures of like uh, churches and and amazing places. And I was like, whoa, it would be nice to try to create like some sort of cool ornaments and stuff like that in designer. But at that time, I don't, I didn't really know how to do that. So I really used that project as a study and, uh, it really helped me out to, 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 to reach a next level basically in designer because I learned so much, uh, when making this project. Uh, then I, re I, I even learned stuff that I'm reusing like, uh, organic materials and stuff like that. It's just like a matter of, okay, if you can do that in designer, you're pretty much capable of doing whatever you want afterward. <laughs> it's interesting you say that because like so many people see these materials that both of you make because you've both done the substance source drops and you know, congrats to you both. But people tend to see these things and think like, surely that's not production ready. Like, how would you use that material in a game? But like, are you creating those materials to push your limits and, and learn new skills that you learn that you can start utilizing in, in other materials? Well, actually, um, it's, it's the purpose of this uh, signature collection is definitely like to uh, show off and uh, showcase the material, uh, showcase the, the program and, and show what, what you can do with the program, how far you can go. But this is definitely not like game ready materials. It's not done for this. It's just done to like show what you can do with the program, try to push as far as you can, uh, push the limits if you can, you know, I see it like that, you know, so I really try to, uh, go as far as I could with my drop, like try to propose like new ideas and, and show that I really love uh, all around architecture and stuff like that in designer uh, and ornaments and stuff like this. But for sure, I, I, I pretty often heard that, that, that kind of feedback. So yeah, okay, you've done a, a building facade in designer, but how can we use that in an environment in video game? I know this is not the point. Exactly. It's this is a study. Skills. It's the skills you get from there, like what you're exactly. in the first Exactly. You just learn so much. Like because you're just playing with things and you're just like learning and these techniques that you learn, you just end up using something else, right? Because totally. I was trying to make Marvel a few weeks back and like I just had to download. I was like, well, he's made it already. I might as well see what he did and you know, see his thought process behind his material. Yeah, because it basically in production, uh, we're uh, mostly making like tileable materials, but it also depends uh, what type of game you're working on. Uh, if it's a third-person shooter, if it if it if it's a, an FPS, uh, are you going to see the tiling a lot? Uh, what's uh, what do you plan for blending blending your materials? Do you need like trim textures? Do you need to create an atlas with decals stuff like that? So it's it's a totally well different work. Uh, to make textures for a video game and make textures for a portfolio, basically. Yeah, that's so true. Like, uh, I think that these kinds of projects, like the signature project, it's just to, uh, like, they, they get the freedom as well to pick the theme that you want to go go with. And it, it's just like, uh, artistically, you can have some freedom. You know, you can do something new, something fresh, and push the limits and study something new. and you're not bound with, uh, like Jonathan was saying, like, you know, in actual production, you need to find where you can use some materials like tilings and you need to make the tilings look not tiling. And, you know, there's so much going into that, that the artistic part is kind of cut off, but, you know, it, it works for games. It's, it's needed for that. But with these kinds of projects, like, you know, like with the ceiling uh, material, that was like, one of the craziest materials that I ever saw. <laughs> and, and now when you're saying it, it's just study. Yes. Like it's, it's like, you know. Thanks, man. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah, but it's it's cool to see that uh, like things that start out as a study or something, they ended up like being one of the best pieces. Like uh, Yeah, well, well, that I, I honestly, I didn't expect that success when I, I posted that material. I just spent a lot of time on it and 
each each time I had like a lunch break or like eventually after the gym I wanted to doodle some stuff instead of just doodling stuff for nothing I was like just creating new components for that ceiling and each of these components were was a sort of like little student study each time so that was funny to like put everything back together and start you know working on the on the albedo the roughness etc but that was definitely a great project I, I really i really enjoyed it and i i, I learned a lot from it so that's uh that's the it's most cool. important yeah. yeah it's really cool to put it like that like uh Oh god, I, I I forgot my train of thought. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to quickly ask you both because substance source drop and just your portfolio work is such high uh, quality. Like, like how do you maintain that consistency and, and not burn out? Like, because the source drop, for example, is it's a big, it's a large amount of work. Do you want to start, Enrico? Uh, sure. <laughs> um, well, it was kind of a burnout to be honest oh. like it was a it was a big project it uh, like not that it wasn't fun or anything it was super cool to make it i'm very happy with it but at the same time it was something new and uh, um, the motivation was high but you know finding time actually to work on quality materials while uh, doing um, all the technical requirements as well like filling each box you know with the check mark that was, uh, like, I'm not saying it was easy at all, but at the same time, it was very fun to do something like that. Like, in, I think, like, with uh, the good thing, what they did with the signature drops in overall is that when you get to pick your own idea, your own theme, you have more motivation to do it. Yeah, you're right. I, I felt the same, basically. Uh, they They've contacted me, like, a long time ago, basically, it was before my GTC talk. They proposed me this, and I said yes, but not until I've done my GTC talk because I'm focused on that right now. So just after it was like maybe, let's say, four months later, I started maybe July or June to work on the drop. But I had some time to think about what I wanted to do, and basically the idea I had was to create like so 15 materials and split this 15 materials into a uh, three environment basically so i was already thinking about like you know materials that i could use on the wall on the ceiling and on the floor and i i knew that people mostly know me because i made that barrack ceiling and that i like making architecture stuff so i wanted to uh you know propose something in in the same kind of theme so I had the ID to go with like, uh, you know, Art Deco, uh, Victorian and Osmanian architecture for my drop. And uh, like Enrico say, you know, I, I he probably overworked uh, as much as I did on, on, on mine. But, you know, I really spent a crazy amount of time on it. I spent like weekends, nights. Uh, it's it, it's a bit silly, honestly, when I, I think about it. That. <laughs> Yeah, doing it like, you know, in, in 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 extra, like when you're working already full time full time per days and after your eight hours per day you go back home and you start working on that until like three AM in the morning. Fuck. Honestly, it's it's yeah, that was a lot of work but I really had a lot of fun on it and I'm super happy about the result. I mean it shows, right? And so many people learn from it when they download it and check it out and you just end up like influencing so many people to like go off and make their own art and it's kind of nice to see right it pays off as much as it is hard work that's cool but yeah definitely honestly when i see like you know some artists like send me send me emails or like uh junior or people who want to start in the industry like asking me like oh, how how can i improve the quality of my materials and stuff like that i i the most of the time is just like keep working you know yeah. work more and it's just gonna get better and better basically you need to spend time on it and your eyes is is gonna change you're gonna see things differently and and you will start to have like keen eye for details at some point and see things differently and everything it's just gonna get better and better so it's just a matter of like you know spending time on it be, be patient 
and and just like uh, stay motivated and you know keep learning and keep pushing your stuff further. Yeah, it's, hard work. it's funny to hear. That. Like I've I've given the same kind of uh, feedback <laughs> to some other people as well. Like the exact same words. Like you know, just don't give up. Just keep working until it's something that you like. Yeah, it's it sounds generic. Like when people hear that, like, is is that all? But like, there's no secret recipe. I mean, I don't think there is. It's just you have to work hard. <laughs> so it's, I think that's the same. Yeah, it like, it is generic use. advice, right? Like if you think about it, it's, <laughs> it's you can't truth. escape it. Yeah, hard work pays off. Yeah. But that's that's very true, actually. <laughs> yeah, that's very is. true. I I when I started 3D, I was I was definitely not the best student uh, when I when I I comes out from school. But you know, I just like busted my ass years after years, and after 14 years, I you know I'm I'm pretty happy when I look back and I I I I check like some old stuff that I was doing at school and I. I I you know I can't believe that I was doing that and I was thinking hey it looks great actually no it it, it didn't <laughs> it, <laughs> I try not to work it might be derailing the the plan Tim had but um like you, you have 15 years experience and, and it's funny that you say you you look back at your work and I know Enrico's like self taught as well um and a lot of artists tend to just forget about the journey and you know they they expect artwork to be amazing straight away. Like what's, that's what's actually it? sorry to cut you off. That no, go for it. To be honest, to be honest like actually, that's uh, one of the topics that I haven't had a stage to talk about. So maybe that's actually right now a good point as well. Like I've had some artists that actually have contacted me, and I've seen like in you know in, in the Facebook group, the ten thousand hours, uh, people post there saying that they finished an artwork and uh, complaining that they're not uh, getting work anywhere in the industry basically sucks and everything all, all that yeah and then it's uh you know you're you're looking back into the, the development that you as a as a person as an artist have had and things that you had to go through like the artwork that i started out as well it was it was very very bad like my god like i'm actually thinking about making a blog post about it <laughs> let's, let's all yeah. do it right after this <laughs> don't put, don't do your uh jonathan into post the artwork graveyard <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, like I just, uh, you know, like people think that uh, get, getting in the industry is easy and uh, doing artwork is easy. Like we were talking before, you know, like you need to keep at it. It's uh, it's not easy. It takes years of work to actually, yeah. you know, produce something. Like there can be uh, artworks that just take months. Like uh, just as an example, like one of the materials that got me back into doing materials because I gave it up for some time ago, like like two years ago. I was like, yeah, I'm not doing it. And uh, I worked on one material for three months, I think. Like three months, I was just working on trying to make some cliff material. But because I was frustrated about myself. And, you know, like when I see people saying that they work a week on a a scene that, you know, usually takes like a few months. And it's like, you know, okay, cool. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, actually, it's it's one of the... uh, it's one of the frustration that you can feel when you start substance designers that um, when you when you first start to make a material, you really have you really spend a lot of time on it, and the result is definitely not good. And when you see like artists like posting stuff every week, you're like, "What the fuck's going on?" Yep. So <clears throat> uh, I I totally understand this, but it's just like getting faster and faster. Um, no matter if you spend like a month or two on a material, as long as it looks good at the end and you're happy about the result, you know, just like focus on the quality instead of like dropping stuff every two days doesn't make sense for me. So I would recommend this for uh, for artists who want to be uh, one day texture artists. Just like spend as much time as you want on a material, but make it looks awesome. Then post it if you want, but you know, doesn't doesn't make sense to like spam our station uh, the plan is just to improve your your personal skill so yeah, yeah exactly right it's yeah. personal art and you, you take your time with your personal art you're not under the clock you're not trying to uh, hit uh, some sort of milestone for for a release or anything just take your time and improve right yep exactly it's quite a common theme that we see a lot online where students will graduate university and 
they're perhaps not ready for to enter production at that point and they think they've got their final project from university they've got their stuff they've worked on these things and they go out there and they get super disheartened because they just get they don't hear anything back they get rejected from from all these places and they kind of have no idea why um and i think that comes back to that kind of patience you were saying that that they don't they don't have that patience to kind of realize that they need to spend more time that they that it takes longer and you might come out of university and just not be ready uh, and that's that's okay if, if you have to spend another one or two years before you're you're in a position to be good enough um i think that's okay but uh if if you for these kind of people who might be in this position where they they want to get in and they're looking at the work and they're looking at these phenomenal things on art station that you guys are putting out and the other kind of top material artists and they're seeing these these studies and these these really ornate things and they're thinking this is what i've got to do or this is where i've got to i've got to produce these kind of things um is that like the right direction do you think or is there something they should be doing should they be focusing on a certain type of material or should they be um looking at you know, what can they do to show that they'll actually be able to fit into production and get those jobs if it's fine like i, I wouldn't mind commenting on that uh, Go for it. like i think that um like if you guys remember like back like some time ago there was an art station where you were able to see the likes and everything views yep. on the portfolio yep. and uh, the reason behind changing that as well was that uh, i think uh, now that art station is one of the main portfolio websites everything everybody sees uh, uh, art as a competition and rather than actually doing something that's going to get you the job so for example if you want to work in a games or in a studio that only does uh, stylized art then you think that all of these artworks are being published so i need to compete with everyone else but that's actually not the case like you just need to produce good art in the studio where you actually want to work and focus on that at least that like it's it's what i've seen that like i've been there as well like i tried to compete with a lot of artists and at some point you just you realize that it's not a competition in a way that who produces better art it's about just producing good art that you're actually happy and uh, recruiters are going to like it as well yeah exactly you're totally right basically you're you're not like making art stuff for likes you don't start a project to get likes you start a project because you want to study something or you want to make a nice piece of art basically so when you have that in mind, you can like just, you know, work on different topics and try to just like develop your knowledge. But I would say for uh, artists who want to start in the industry as texture artists, uh, I would definitely recommend them to not only do textures, but also do environment art, uh, know how to bake an asset, like sculpt in ZBrush, all this kind of knowledge is totally useful when you want to be a texture artist in the video game industry um, because you're going to work with modelers, environment artists, and you're going to have to give them uh, a recipe that is going to work in their environment. So you need to do a lot of back and forth with them. But you, if you already know how to create an environment from scratch, it's way easier for you to come with solution and propose good ideas and stuff that is going to be really useful in game you were mentioning earlier about how at work you have to kind of make um tiling materials and trims and these kind of uh materials that are used to kind of author environments do you have any advice for someone as you're saying as it's good to try to make environments if you want to be a materials artist you got any kind of good tips about how someone can look at creating these materials that are useful for this production um, as opposed to kind of just focusing on trying to do these these studies well I think the the, the both work basically but uh, studies are more uh, like I would say like let's let's take my bar ceiling so this kind of project is more like a study to learn how to do new stuff that you basically couldn't do or didn't know how to do 
So this is the kind of project that is useful, but this is not the kind of material that you're going to do in production, right? So in production, if you had to create uh, this kind of ceiling, you will probably have uh, a few trims. You will have uh, a few components that are probably going to be baked uh, on another atlas and uh, a few tileable materials that you're going to add underneath. So it, it's going to be a composition of different elements of different textures uh, that you're going to use to create the same uh, the, the similar effect in a video game because you have like constraint uh, due to the, the performance and everything. So it's it's two different approach, but you will have to study with like more uh, the technical aspect of how to technically push my knowledge further in a program, and you will have how am I gonna tackle the texturing of that environment in production. These are like two different things. So if you're a um... If you're a recruiter, these are kind of the questions that you might want answering when you're looking at someone's portfolio, if they can, if they understand that production and if they're yeah. able to actually create those, those kind of um, pieces that would be needed to create the environments for the game. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Enrica, have you got any advice on the uh, same kind of topic of how, um, obviously, the, the stuff you've done for textures.com? whole bunch of really great useful tileable materials of how someone can go about producing um those those kind of materials that are are useful for production well i, I think john said already so well about everything like producing uh, like not limiting yourself just to environments maybe like even doing characters if you're interested in that like just doing something more the materials and showing how to actually use them is uh, one of the best things i guess because like mm -hmm. it's uh, uh i just had a talk with uh one guy as well about it like it doesn't matter uh what resources you use it like you can make cool looking textures but you need to need, need to be able to actually use them in production it doesn't matter if, what is it was it going to be if it's going to be vfx or if it's actually a game environment but you need to know what the tiny texture is going to produce and how to use it, how to actually make it work. It's uh, like one of the mistakes that people do is they go to uh, mega scans and they drag and drop everything into the scene and think they're, you know, they're, you're done. But you need to <laughs> work a little bit more, like, you know, use the atlases in uh, designer material, for example, and then put everything into together as a small diorama, for example. But yeah. Uh, just to add something um, for for artists like interested into this, like uh, you also need to think that in production you're not making materials with displacement and stuff like that. So this is different. You're working with height map, but the height map is gonna be used to blend your materials together. You will never see like EV tessellation real time, except in UE5 maybe. <laughs> 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 but uh, otherwise, you know, uh, so far we can't do that. So uh, this is this is a different that I wanted to uh, that I wanted to mention as well because uh, sometimes, like especially especially like new artists, like work like coming out from school, don't really see the difference, and they want to do crazy things with displacement and isolation. But this is not what you're gonna do in production. So. Uh, it's safer to focus on like fundamentals, like start to create a, a brick wall. I know everybody did it, but you know, start by this, uh, create a wooden floor, uh, create like, you know, just simple textures, but this is what you're going to use mainly uh, when you're going to work on, in video game, you know. Yeah, it's uh, but... funny you mentioned that because there was someone I used to work with uh, who was used to be quite in charge of uh, hiring and things like that. And um, he always, whenever he saw things with heavy displacement, all these really overly tessellated meshes uh, for someone presenting material, he kind of just went, well, it's not really representative of what 
we want to see in game and your technique is not there you're just kind of going nuts with all these fancy features and you're not really showing what a good material is and he used to kind of get annoyed and that almost entirely derailed the uh, person applying into sort of a no pile it's it's a good it's a good thing to just focus on the fundamentals first really it's actually interesting that you brought up uh, Unreal Engine 5, the the, the demo, because that's actually what I was going to um, mention with the kind of Enrico bringing up mega scans there. Something there's been quite a lot of chatter online about how they were kind of meant, they said that they were dragging and dropping these cinematic assets into Unreal Engine 5, and, and people have been saying about, oh, is everything going to be mega scans now? Is everything just going to be photo scans? Is there going to be place for material artists? Um, when Unreal Engine 5 kind of comes out, becomes mainstream, um, it'd be interesting to grab your guys' thoughts on that, actually, about where you think the place of, will the role of materials art change, or how will that kind of shift with the technology that we're seeing? Who wants to go? Uh, I can start if you want. Go for uh, it. Well, basically, I think that, you know, the demo looks awesome. Um, I don't have anything to say about it. But the thing is, you know, every art director is going to have his own vision of the game he wants. So n not everyone we will like to do a realistic, like, one-for-one -one game, like, realistic. So I think that we still have some, <laughs> we will have some job for the, the incoming years, for sure. But uh, because you want to add some you know, some stylization and some subtle variation in the materials. Because when you look at a game, uh, except maybe even like the order is super realistic, but you, you still have like a, uh, some sort of like, uh, you know, it, it's sort of twisted reality. So everything is not like one for one. It's, a, it's, it's slightly stylized, but it's really close from reality. But uh, as you discussed in the previous uh, a podcast, uh, you know, when you look at Uncharted, it's you know people are gonna say, hey, it's it's realistic, but it's it's pretty stylized actually. You have a lot of contrast, you have flashy colors, uh, some some you know some shape are simplified because you want to enhance like the medium and the large shapes more than the the micro details. So it's it's a mix of you know it, it depends of what an what art director we want, but for me, we still have like a lot of job for the for the coming years. Yeah, <laughs> I think that uh, the tech demo was uh, for Unreal Engine Five was more to show what what the engine is going to be capable of now, and uh, using that in actual production, it's uh, I'm fairly sure that uh, the industry needs to catch up with that, and. Uh, like if you're actually processing a surface like as a scan artist that you still need the artistic touch to fix things and uh, as a texture artist material artist i don't think that you're going to run out of work anytime soon because it's, it's just because the industry is shifting to something new it doesn't mean that uh, the jobs are going to be lost i think the job specifications and requirements are going to just change a little bit and uh, as Jonathan was saying, like you know, it depends on what the art director wants as well. And uh, in that case, like if if you take mega scans, like I'm still saying the same. Like I think people are using it wrongly. Like it's uh, it shouldn't be that you just drag and drop passes from there. You should be able to, for example, you sculpt the base rock shape that you want to have, and you're gonna just uh, boolean out uh, uh, just some parts of the rock, so you're gonna have the main shape still hand sculpted and uh, you can have some details cut in or some shapes taken away uh, by the mega scan asset. So you're actually using it more versatile rather than just out of the box. Yeah, I think the important thing with UE5 as well is it's specific to that engine. I imagine you guys use something different at Counterplay and, and WB Games, and we use something different at Frontier, and Luan has their um, you know, star engine as well. So not everyone has access to that so i kind of agree that you know that's the weak jobs for everyone thankfully <laughs> anything there might be more jobs right because yeah, like yeah, when substance came around everybody now is looking at substance for jobs and things like that right so yeah there'll be more jobs 
yeah, it's not like substance uh, or procedure textures or even just legacy texturing is going to disappear. It, it might slow down a little bit, but then again, another road is going to be taken and that's going to expand so much that people are going to be... Yeah, exactly. That's good. That's good that um, hopefully anyone who's had those fears are now alleviated that they <laughs> It's good that we're not losing our job. It's great. <laughs> Material art will not become invalid when Unreal Engine 5 drops. I've heard it here first. <laughs> cool. So we're at a, probably a good point for us to start kind of wrapping up. And we've got a few questions from um, our Patreon, the EXP Patreon. Um, so I will throw these questions over to you guys. I've got two questions. Um, so the first one, um, Alexander has asked, if there are any kind of lesser known, really good resources that you guys use to kind of either learn or um, to help improve your materials, um, Jonathan. Uh, you mean like uh, resources, like tutorials, stuff like that? You mean? Yeah, any websites, tutorials, books, any any secret, um, you know, seances that you attend where you get this information <laughs> from, just anything you've got. <laughs> well, <laughs> basically... Uh, the, the I think the first tutorial that I watched uh, or files that I opened were from uh, Chris Hudson uh, because it's really good and uh, I really learned a lot like uh, just going through his graphs. Uh, same goes with Daniel Tiger or Josh Lynch, but or even Ben Wilson. But you know everybody pretty much know these guys, so that they're they're clearly like the best in the industry in texturing, uh, part of the best. So um, like I would recommend for a beginner to go through their graph. Um, this, this is what I did first, like years back. And uh, that was definitely uh, super helpful. Yeah, there's quite a lot of power in actually just studying someone's graph and seeing how they've made it and perhaps yeah. playing around with some of the parameters to see what that changes. I think it's quite common for people to want to, you know, go on and watch one of Daniel's tutorials and follow that through. But then when it comes to being able to make that themselves, they get a bit stuck. But uh, if they study those graphs, they might help unlock something there. Awesome. And Enrico, what about you? Have you got any secret resources for uh, being as amazing as you are? <laughs> Thank you for the kind words. <laughs> but uh, I agree again with Jonathan. Like, I think we've gone down rough the same road with uh, designer like uh, finding as many tutorials as you possibly can is the best way to go because every artist has its own workflows ideas yep. and like ways to execute something new that you you haven't even thought of like something like with the distance node I, I saw it just like half a year ago I think I saw something that was done with it and now it's stuck in my head I use it almost everywhere and something that yeah, yeah that's very true like just going through the graph another uh, uh, from another artist just like sometime you, you open your eyes and you're like shit you do that like that yes, and, exactly. and you realize that okay so i can do this that way and you you start to like you know think about different ways of doing it. like just seeing another approach on the same kind of material just like open your eyes on so many things sometimes so it's it's very useful to, to go through a graph from someone, uh, well, I definitely recommend it. Yeah, like uh, with uh, Chris Sargent that you were mentioning before, with him, for example, like if you start off with making bricks, you know, you, you make a brick shape and you put it into a tile generator or whatnot. And then I opened up uh, 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 Chris's uh, graph and it was done totally differently. He actually mm -hmm. has a, you know, a brick generator that you know, just one brick and you can change the bevels and everything. Yeah. But just by the, changing the one node with just a boxy shape to something like a brick center that has a small bevel, it makes the bricks totally different. Like the feel is so much more organic and you, need, yeah. you never thought about it, you know, something as simple as that. It's a yeah, moment where you realize I've been doing it all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and you can you can do that on pretty much everything. This is basically what I, I talked about during my GDC talk last year. It was like, okay, when you're making a material, just start to look at what type of components do you have in this material. So if you're creating like a forest ground, 
just create leaves, just create branches, uh, just create everything separately, like tiny plants and stuff like that, and put them back together in your main graph. So you can like just you know create some sort of small generator, and once you have to create another type of material afterward, you can still go back to this graph and pick a bunch of, uh, of components that you have already done and bring them back in a new one, et cetera. So it's, it's also a good way of like, you know, uh, iterating on other textures. It's a very good point in, in overall, like material creation. It's uh, to break it down into small parts rather than uh, focusing on everything. Yep. It's, uh, if you take yeah, like the first uh, ground, for example, like if you take it as a whole, you want to make the leaves really quickly. You want to make the twigs really quickly, small rocks, add everything there, make the mud, make the grass. And at some point, it's just so overwhelming that you're just going to leave the project. Rather than doing something like that, like breaking it down, like Jonathan was saying, that you just focus on leaves. And, you know, you can have an actual separate material just because you decided to break it down. It's a very, very good way of uh, approaching material creations. Question, that sounds very powerful. The, um, distance trick? That you learned last year. I've, I've just been thinking, what, what did he learn? <laughs> How do you? He just. It? <laughs> it's uh, it's just can. expanding. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's like doing cracks, uh, but uh, expanding uh, things like flood fill, like gradients, and all that. Like, if you want to have a paint peeling rather than actually having cracks with the uh, gradi gradation, you can actually expand the gradation to the nearest edge. Uh, with the gradient, if you use the the cracks there, it's very difficult to explain. It's just, like it's just by talking, but yeah, I kind of get it. I think sounds. I might have to test that after the podcast. Probably won't. <laughs> <laughs> Tag team. <laughs> cool. And the other question that we have for this week uh, from Doru, uh, he wants to know if there are any good habits um, that you guys have or would recommend to help kind of level up and keep that motivation to progress as an artist. Let's go back to Jonathan again. Uh, well, I would say um, just keep feeding your eyes. Uh, keep looking around you when you like walk around in the street, like look all the tiny details that you can like bring to your textures. Um, all this kind of thing are super useful, but I would say like just, you know, generally just like keep doing stuff, keep keep like looking at what other artists do. It's it's always inspiring. Uh I got a bunch of artists that I that I that I follow and I like to, you know, uh I, I love to see what they're uh what they're releasing. So I get some new ideas sometime. But I think like getting that sort of like motivation uh, by seeing the the all this community like doing stuff all the time. I think it's it's really a good way to you know stay motivated and keep working on stuff. So yeah, th this would be my advice. Just like you know, uh, keep working and uh, stay motivated as much as you can. And Enrico. How about you? Uh, well, I would go back into the uh, topic that I was explaining before that not consider everything as a competition and find motivation and challenge from artworks that you can find everywhere or even just the world around you. Like if you see something that can be turned into material, you don't need to go and see if somebody has already done it and be like, ah, I don't know if I want to do it. But, you know, if you want to do some cool artworks, just do it because it's it's going to help you learn so many new things and it's uh, it doesn't just apply to even materials themselves like it's a good habit as a 3d artist in overall because you know we have the freedom to create whatever we want however we want so you know find something that's cool to do and just do it so that you know you, you're, you're going to have the motivation to actually work on projects that interest you so that next day you when you, when you go back to work you, you do your work and then you're excited about actually, you know, doing your personal work as well, while expanding your skills and finding new workflows, and all that can just lead to better jobs, better opportunities, and brilliant. So, thank you so much, guys, for joining us today for this chat. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. Well, thanks so, for having me, guys. Uh, that was great talking with you. 
Yeah, likewise. Thanks so much for having me. Absolute pleasure. Yeah, absolute yeah it's, pleasure. Been a, it's been a great chat. I've actually learned quite a lot. <laughs> so it's been a pleasure. Thanks for, thanks for joining us on the EXP podcast. So this has been great. So thank you to our uh, guests, Enrico and Jonathan, and to my co-host this episode, Luan and Kem. And if you want to feed your creative mind, get involved with environment art, uh, head over to the Experience Points website, read the articles, join our Discord, follow us on Twitter. There'll be links to all of those in the description below. Thank you, everyone, for listening in. And until next time, take care. QEXP noises from Luan. Ooh, take care. I like it. It's a nice sign-off line there. I have one final quick question that I like to throw at the end of these podcasts. Just something fun to uh, to chat about. Uh, usually, what's your favorite game? What's your favorite movie? Or something that's inspired you lately? Let's go with you, Jonathan. Do you have a favorite game? Um, if I have to pick one, uh, I got plenty of game that I love, but I would probably say like Uncharted Four. Because that was a slap in the face when it came out. <laughs> <laughs> and, it really was. Yeah, it was. And I, 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 I replayed it at the moment, basically, because I've done like the one, two, three, and I wanted to redo the four. And damn, man, it still looks pretty awesome. It looks great. Like, even it looks awesome. Incredible game. The atmosphere. Now, Shit, I need to buy it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, every place is, is like, whoa, it's it's all the time stunning. When you just arrive in front of a temple, you're like, shit. It looks you awesome. always get these crazy establishing shots that just drop, yeah. like, draw dropping. It's so Exactly. Good. So, uh, yeah, if I have to say just one. I would say, yeah, Shard it for. That's a, that's a, that's a great choice. To be fair. How about you, Enrico? Uh, it's, it's very difficult to just put it into one game exactly. like, <laughs> That's why artistically uh, i love god of war it's a beautiful game like yeah. the story the narrative like the artistic direction quality it's amazing but as my favorite game i would still put uh, a game that i actually didn't like until i started working at ub is uh, rainbow six I've never heard about the game before actually joining there, and now it's one of my favorite games. With I just I love strategy games, and when you can do tactics and combining everything together, that because... game has turned some of my friends into enemies. So easily. <laughs> <laughs> I've been there, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that no, nothing quite like that game to keep to get your sweat going. <laughs> <laughs> nice, thanks for that.